Hey, this is Jason Falls. Hey, this is Mari Smith. Hey, everybody, this is CC Chapman. Hey, this is Jason Keith. Michael Stelzner here. Hi there, I'm Rand Fishkin. Hey, this is John Jans. Hey, it's Jay Bear. Hey, this is Brian Solis. Hi, this is David Wells, and you're watching Inbound Now with... Wait, no. Hi, this is Seth Godin, and you're watching Inbound Now with David Wells. Hey guys, David Wells here, excited to bring you the first episode of Season 2 of Inbound Now. My guest today is Mr. Paul Rotzer of PR2020. He wrote the book, The Marketing Agency Blueprint, which is an awesome book. I highly recommend it. So we're going to dive into his thoughts behind the book about how the traditional marketing agency model is broken today and his ideas on moving towards the future. He gives some great tips and tricks on how to price your different services and also how to hire the correct marketing agency, what questions to ask, what to look out for, and what have you. I'm doing a contest for the book. Head over to the inboundnow.com slash blog. Check out the post. Details for the contest in there. If you win, I will send you a copy of the Marketing Agency Blueprint. If you haven't had a chance to check out the new inboundnow.com site, I highly recommend doing so. It's actually my newest project. I have a ton of marketing web-based apps that I think you'll be interested in, including a like to download app where you can put a content offer behind a like button to increase your fan count and social traffic to your site, a tweet to download app, a Pinterest pin it to download app. Those are just a few. Go to inboundnow.com slash apps to check out all of the apps that I have there. Also, while watching this episode, feel free to tweet at me or Paul. I'm at David Wells. Paul's at Paul Rotzer. And definitely let us know what you think. If you have any other questions or you know, if you're feeling the episode, if you're not feeling the episode, let us know. I want this show to become more interactive with the audience. and I'd love to hear your feedback. Feel free to reach out. Without further ado, here is the interview. So who are you and what do you do? Paul Razor, founder and CEO of PR2020 and author of the Marketing Agency Blueprint. Awesome, awesome. I got a chance to read the Marketing Agency Blueprint. I thought it was a fantastic book and I had a ton of questions on exactly how you've implemented this structure in your business and, and kind of the, the things that you've learned along the way. So Perfect. let's dive into it. So the book is really about how traditional marketing agencies are kind of, uh, the, the model is, is not really working as well as it used to be, and, and you're talking about flipping the model on its head. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, my background was from a traditional PR agency. So I spent, I interned in college at a traditional agency, and then I spent about five and a half years at an agency. And we did, it wasn't just PR, but at the time we were talking 2000 to 2005 range. So we were doing a lot of strategic planning, brand marketing. We dabbled in advertising a little bit, but mostly it was PR. Um, but at the time, I was kind of observing what was going on and the way that agency was run, and it was run off of the Burson Marsteller model, which for people who aren't familiar, Burson Marsteller was and probably still is one of the larger agencies in the world. But that's where um, my boss had come from. So we were running off of like the 1980s operating manual for Burson Marsteller, basically. So as I was growing up, while we were we were a great firm, and I, I still admire what that agency that came from does. Um, there was a, just a ton of inefficiencies, and so I was always struggled with the billable hours. I always struggled with how do we differentiate ourselves from other firms? Where's new business come from? We would have these hour quotas where you'd want to, you have to be five or seven hours a day billable, and, but I never knew where the work would come from. And at the end of the day, all that really matters was that the client got the invoice at the end of the month that hit our quotas, and there wasn't really that much consideration given to well, what did we do for them in that time. So yeah, we hit our hour quotas. But did we actually produce bottom line results and did we make an impact on their business? So I just, early in my career, started looking around thinking, wow, this doesn't, this doesn't really make sense. Is this really how the industry works? Because it seems very agency-centric and, and very inefficient. Right, right. And, and in the book, you say that, you know, the, these new kind of hybrid agencies are built on efficiency and productivity, kind of yeah. shifting away from the, the billable hours model. So, like, why why are project based fees uh, and value based fees, you know, better for for both parties involved, the client and the agency? I mean, to me, in, in the billable hours, again, it goes back to the whole idea of it's it's 
the simplest solution for the agency. If we do an hour of work, we bill the client an hour of time. Now, that hour, if you're doing administrative work or if you're doing high-level strategic planning, is basically equal in, in Bill of Hour model. So does it really make sense to be charging the client the same amount of time for sending emails back and forth or building a crisis communications plan? They're very different values, and the client should have a different perceived value and therefore be willing to pay different amounts. So part of it is just the overall perception of value of what you're delivering, and the other is because we multitask, because as, as humans, as professionals, we have very limited ability to actually focus on singular tasks for extended periods of time, how is it logical to be constantly billing clients or constantly on the clock for a client when in reality you're, you're probably not actually focused on that client or that project for an hour straight ever? So to me, it just came back to the agents. The burden should be on the agency to be as productive and efficient as possible. And the more you can define a scope and set a standard price or a service package under a set uh, monthly fee, and then deliver what you're promising to do that actually returns results for them. Like it's, a, it's just a much better relationship, more transparent. Everyone knows what they're getting, and you rarely run into instances where you get to the invoice at the end of the month, and the client's like, what in the world did you do for this 100 hours? Because you're very transparent all along with what you're doing and what you're hoping, what results you're hoping to generate for them by doing it. Right, right, and and with the projects that you're doing, you're st are you still like measuring? You know, okay, this project's going to take us this many hours. It still comes back to hours on your guys' side, right? But you you kind of lump it in together. Is that a is that kind of a trial and error process for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. We we track everything probably more so than agencies that use bill blowers. We're we are um, fanatical about how we track and report our time because we're measuring the efficiency rate. So we're still trying to generate a specific dollar amount for every hour of work we do because at the end of the day that's what we have to create as an agency but we're constantly looking at how efficiently do we turn one hour of work into that certain revenue amount so we have to look at those things because it helps us evolve pricing moving forward so we may put a set price out in the market and realize while wow, that was way off because we track so let's say blog post writing as an example we may think it'll take two hours per blog post, but after we do 10 of them, realize it actually takes 3.5. So we had a set fee maybe for those blog posts, but now we can adjust that set fee moving forward because we know the actual amount of time it may take to write something. Okay. So we track everything and then adjust pricing as we're going based on historical performance. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's an iterative process. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. So, and, and you talk a lot about in the book, you know, uh, kind of an a la carte pricing model. Um, how, how did you guys really uh, decide on your pricing? Again, is it an iterative model where you price something at, at some point and then you go back and, and fix it? Because pricing is like one of the hardest things a business can do, right? So how did you guys really wrap your head around that? Uh, honestly, the guy spent, uh, I one time estimated about 600 hours creating our original service guide. So this is going back to 2005 when I was, right before I started the company, that was like the, the majority of the time I spent building our model was trying to build that standard service guide. It had 102 services and then three levels of each service basically. So we're talking about 300 plus uh, different pricing variables. And so that was basically me guessing. I literally sat down and said, how long would it take to write a brochure? How long would it take to write an article, to do a press release, to develop a communications plan? And I guessed at pretty much everything based on my five years of experience and based on what I thought was possible. Um, and then we've literally just iterated nonstop since then. And because we track everything, we have six plus years of data now to tell us how long each task or each project takes. And then we can adjust our pricing based on that information. So. The one thing we did early on that was somewhat unusual in the industry was published our pricing. So we literally did have that a la carte menu to start where people could go and see exactly what we were charging for each project. Um, so, you know, the market, other people, other agencies could look at that and come up with their own pricing. Um, but we have definitely changed it regularly over time. Right, right. So so displaying your pricing online, I mean, did you guys see that as a huge benefit and, and viewing you guys as more of a transparent agency or what was kind of the thought process behind that? Because a lot of people are scared. I mean, it's it, it is on a per project basis for most people, and displaying you know the price scares people away sometimes. And in the early days, like when I first did it, when I finished the pricing guide, I launched the company in November of '05. I published the service guide in January of '06, and I, I hesitated for about a month, debating was it uh, was I out of my mind to to actually put the pricing online. 
And then I just thought the benefits we would gain from doing it were far greater than continuing to hide pricing. So we thought the more transparent, the more trust we would build, the better chance we'd have. And plus, what ended up being one of the greatest benefits to it was it pre-qualified leads. So people who went to our site and knew exactly what we were charging wouldn't waste our time building proposals and then get our costs and say, oh, well, you guys are out of our league. We're not going to pay for that. So by publishing our pricing, we've, in essence, continually uh, attracted the types of companies we want to work with. So two years ago, our enterprise package was, I think, $2,000 a month. Today, it's $12,000 a month. So we've continually moved upstream, and by having our service, service pricing on our site, we've uh, intentionally moved away from the lower level service packages which we've struggled to make a profit on and we've also moved away from project-based work which we've struggled to make a profit on so we use that transparency and pricing to attract the, the type and the quality of prospects we want for, for our business like See, too, because it actually makes the like the business development process can be ten times more efficient when you've standardized all your pricing so that when someone wants something like say a website design you already know the scope of a website project and what you're going to charge. So, like, we can take, we can convert a ten thousand dollar a month account in five hours or less because we have completely standardized everything we do, and then you just customize the positioning of it and how you're structuring that package. But there's no question marks as to what things cost. So it's wildly efficient for us to do new new business development as well, in addition to the transparency clients benefit from. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And and does this kind of it kind of gets rid of the RFP kind of agency model, right? I mean, are you guys yeah, doing a lot of P RFPs, or it kind of yeah, eliminates that? We do RFPs. We have probably done maybe two in the entire existence of the agency, and they were in both cases most likely because we were brought in by another partner. We would never take an RFP as a business development opportunity. We we just we literally just turn them away if they come in. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it seems like a tremendous waste of time for kind of both parties to, I mean, well, I guess not on the client side, but on the agency side, kind of building that plan and then maybe getting the business, it seems like an inefficient model for sure. Well, and plus, it's, my feeling on our piece has always been it's stealing creative. You get six agencies to throw their best ideas at you, you pick the ones you want, and then you pick the agency that you were probably going to pick before the process started because it's a friend of yours. It, it's just... The whole system to me has is, is always been broken, and that's why we just never got into it. I had so many bad experiences. In the five and a half years I was at a traditional agency, it, it was the experiences we went through there was enough for my career. I, I was done going through our piece. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, cool. So, you know, what what is it, a hybrid agency? What what exactly constitutes a new hybrid agency? Talking about a new, you know, the broken model. Now, what's the new model of hybrid? What does that mean? The main thing to me is there's in the book we talk about the three catalysts that are really affecting um, the, the adjustments and the evolution of the agency. And the first one is change velocity, which basically means everything's happening so quickly, technology is changing so fast that it directly affects the types of services you can offer, the systems you can run, use to run your agency. Everything moves so quickly so that when you look at the type of agency that needs to exist, to uh, advance within that type of system, there's four things that it comes down to. The first one is tech savvy, because if you're not paying attention to how quickly things are changing and what technology there is, then you can't adapt fast enough and, and bring value to your clients and adjust your agency. The second is the integrated services, which we'll probably touch on a little bit more, but you can't do services in silo anymore. You can't just be a web developer because search and, and social and content affect the quality of a website now. So you have to look at either be able to plan on an integrated uh, basis or offer everything in-house through one agency. Um, versatile talent, because to have integrated services, you have to have talent that can work across multiple marketing disciplines. And the last one is diversified revenue to where you're not just reliant on service revenue anymore. You're looking at things like how do you make money through publishing, through online education and information products, through software licensing, through commissions and affiliate programs. There's, there's all these other revenue channels so you're not strictly trying to hit a 10% profit margin on services. You can make potentially greater than that because you can have high margin revenue in other areas. Right, right. So I, I recently caught an interview with you and Mitch Joel, um, one of my favorite podcasts, Six Pixels yeah. Separation, where you were talking about you know, how you believe the future of the industry are these hybrids with the diversified revenue streams. How are you guys, You know, what are your different revenue streams that you've built at PR 2020? One is one of the early ones we started experimenting with, and this is what 
kind of started leading me down this path was the HubSpot Bar program. So as a HubSpot Bar, as you bring new op, uh, new business into HubSpot, you basically get commission for life on those licenses. So that was one. And what's happening is there's a whole ecosystem of those types of companies developing that are starting to look on how do we build through the agency network. So you have opportunities to have these third-party software that you can actually use to enhance the types of services you deliver, but at the same time, you can actually make money on commissions. Um, obviously, the book um, was a separate revenue stream for us, so I didn't do the book as a standalone author. It, it's Everything funnels back through the agency. So if there's any royalties on the book deal or anything that comes along with the book, um, including speaking engagements and things like that, all that revenue funnels back through the agency. So you build the personal brands of the people within the company, and then you have the potential to expand the type of revenue they can bring in. Uh, and then online education, we launched the marketing agency Insider as part of the book to complement the book. And with that, we have the online academy um, where we did the Blueprint series was a five-part webinar event in February that HubSpot actually sponsored. Um, and that was a separate thing. We charged $495 a piece for, to register for that. So that's created additional revenue streams. And we're using that as a, a basically a beta test to see can we take that model and then apply it to PR 2020 and start looking at expanding into online education as an agency. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. So so you started in, in uh, 2005 with, it was just you and a partner, right? Yeah, it was, it was me. I, my partner was basically put up the debt funding to do it and then he functions as a CFO. Gotcha, gotcha. And now you've grown to you know 11 employees. So like hiring talent, you touched a little bit on it um, and I think you hit a, a, a valid point where you're hiring for multi-faceted uh, people where they don't just have one skill set. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think marketers can't just be marketers anymore, and, and you know, web developers can't just do web development. They have to kind of expand, uh, you know, put on more more than one hat, right? Yeah, I think it's it's one of the biggest issues within the marketing industry as a whole, not just agencies. That's really not being talked about enough. Um, what we've done is we tend to hire people out of journalism school with PR majors. More than half of our employee base are Ohio University grads from their journalism school. And what and that's where I went, so we knew like the type of talent that would be that would come out of there, so it's like an easy place for us to recruit out of. But basically we know that writing is at the core of, of a the strength of a strength for marketers today. Then we look at things like search. And three years ago, doing search might have been a little more complex than it is today because today it's, it's not really about as much algorithms and changes Google's making as it is creating great content, doing the obvious on-page optimization things, and building links naturally. Well, that doesn't you don't need to be a 10-year search vet to, to do that. You can be trained those elements. Um, social media is an essential piece. And, you know, being savvy online and understanding how to build a personal brand, again, you can train people to do that. Analytics becomes essential. But Google offers free training on how to use Google Analytics. HubSpot offers tons of resources on how to understand analytics. So all these different things that make for a much more versatile marketer, there's resources out there to teach them. And so we just built our own internal curriculum in a lot of cases through third-party resources to take people who have raw talent in the core competencies and then expand what they're capable of doing through training programs. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool. So switching gears a little bit, um, you know, for companies uh, out there watching that, you know, maybe considering outsourcing some of their marketing, um, you know, or PR activities, what are some questions that they should ask, you know, the prospective agencies that they're looking at to kind of vet to see if it's the right fit and if it's kind of a new hybrid agency that's really knows their stuff. Yeah, and to me, the easiest way to do it is you don't have to ask questions. Just go to their site and see what they do. Because historically, agencies always took the excuse of, well, we never have time for ourselves because we're so busy with our clients. It's, it's BS. Like, if you're actually good at what you do, if you're savvy in social media, if you preach the importance of content and blogging, um, search optimization, analytics. Like If you're talking about all these things, then you better be doing them because that's what demonstrates your capability to actually help a client. So I would much rather go to an agency site and see a well-thought-out site with calls to action and landing pages, um, downloadable content like eBooks and white papers or infographics, things that tell me they actually understand what they're selling services around, a great blog, that's what I want to see. I just want to see people who are actually doing it well. And then obviously you can get into, okay, talk to me about my accounting. How would that be structured? How, how does your project management work? Um, what type of talent do you hire? I, I would really drill into the talent behind. I would ask 
um, about retention rates of employees is a huge thing because the main reason that clients will eventually stay with an agency is because of the people they work with on the account. And so when you have agencies that constantly have turnover of their talent, like say a year and a half or two years or less is the average turnover, that's a problem. So you really want to work with agencies that do a good job of retaining talent that speaks volumes to their quality as a company. Gotcha, gotcha. So retaining talent, you know, how, how do you guys retain talent? What's, what's you know, some, something that keeps an employee happy and, you know, working to their maximum potential? We spend a ton of time on culture. I mean, it's one of the biggest things that I've focused on from day one. Is first, hiring people who want to be a part of something big, bigger than themselves, greater than themselves. They want to build something significant. So you have to have people who believe they're part of a much larger mission. And so the type of people you would hire to there naturally are like intrinsically motivated people. And so we look like Daniel Pink's Drive. If you read Drive and then you understand the type of people he's talking about, those are the type of people we look to hire. So you want people who aren't necessarily in it just for the money. They're, they're in it to build a great career. Um, so we look for those type of people for sure. And then we want people who obviously care about the clients, who um, you know are incredibly motivated, who are very uh, detail-oriented. And we basically give them the vehicles once they're here then to build their own careers. So a lot of um, flexible and freedom, flexibility and freedom in, in development of their careers and make sure we support them. So we like take them to conferences, give them a chance to get out and meet new people and experience new things. And as an agency, we're 100% committed to constantly evolving and innovating. And so it's always creating new career opportunities for them. And we always involve them in that process. So it's not me just, you know, deciding what's going on um, as an agency and saying, here's what we're doing. It's us actually sitting people down and saying, okay, we're thinking of going in this direction. What do you guys want to do? And we'll build committees to, to innovate within the agency, within the industry. Okay, cool, cool. So, so where do you see PR 2020, uh, you know, going, moving into the future? You know, what's the, what's the vision that you're instilling in your employees? I think a lot of the book was not about what we'd achieved, but what I thought was possible for agencies. And so there's a lot of things I wrote in the book that we don't necessarily excel at, stuff that we haven't really realized yet. And so really once I finished writing the book, which would have been July of 2011, I finished it and then it goes through editing. It eventually came out in December of 2011. Um, a lot of that really motivated me to shift what we were doing and what we were trying to achieve. So we're really now trying to the tech savvy thing, I think we do pretty well. We're trying to focus on that. Integrated services, we're starting to expand some of the services we offer. Um, the talent, we can always do a better job of recruiting. Um, we've done a great job of retaining, but I think we can have a deeper pipeline of, of top talent. And the diversified revenue is probably my biggest focus right now, is if you can really achieve that, then you can build a successful, profitable agency. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. So you wrote an ebook on devising an inbound marketing game plan. Um, yeah. Can you share, you know, some of the stuff that's worked exceedingly well for you guys at PR twenty twenty? Yeah, I mean, the inbound marketing game plan was kind of my model of what integrated services should look like and what I thought was possible and and what we started the direction we started going with our client base. So it's basically um, web and brand, looking at those as the foundation, and then search, social, content, and PR. And to me, the, the social and content are really the drivers. So what I think we've done really well is had a, a very a strong blog that we don't just use to drive links and traffic. We actually use it to add value to our existing customer base and to prospective clients and, and even to our peers in the industry. So I think we've done a really good job with our blog as a, a base um, and we've invested in that. We have an editor that's assigned to the blog. Everyone on the team contributes to it. So we make that a core piece of our success. And then obviously enabling our employees to build strong personal brands is a, is a big piece of what we do. So that to me is probably, you know, the stuff we lay out in the ebook, we've actually tried to execute ourselves. And I think we've done a pretty good job. We've stumbled at times, but overall, I think we've done a good job with it. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. So, so chapter nine in the book is all about embracing failure. So, kind of the flip side to that coin, you know, since two thousand five, what did you guys run into that you know you thought would be a hit and just kind of fizzled out or what have you? I I always go back to the first time we rolled out service packages. We introduced the first service packages sometime in, in early to mid-2008, but we really rolled them out at the first Inbound Marketing Summit in uh, September of 2008. Those things were so wildly unprofitable. Um, 
but it was it, it was good. Like we had to take a chance. We had to put them out there and see what worked and what didn't. And we found they they really didn't work at all. Um, but that's fine. And then in 2010, we rolled out the next type of service packages, and we started bundling content at some point. Well, bundling content was a huge risk. Like for say 3,000 a month, people get four blog posts, or for 5,000 a month, they would get four blog posts and 1,000 words of premium content. The reality is we had no idea if that was going to work or not and how to actually price content into them, but we knew we had to do it. We knew we needed content as a piece of it for clients to actually see success, otherwise they wouldn't commit to it. So we put them in there, and, and we they weren't profitable. I mean, we have some, some clients we go back to in 2010 and 2009 and look at efficiencies, and they're so poor. Um, but we learned a ton, and we learned how to better price content, and we learned which areas we wanted to focus on and which we didn't. So our thing is we've always been willing to take a risk, and we've always taken risks on services and pricing, which I think is obviously essential to what we're trying to do. Um, and then the other one I would say is like the marketing agency insider. Like I, I had no idea when we put that Blueprint series out if we would get one sign-up for it, and we've had, I think, probably more than 75 now people have registered for that series. And we had advice from people whose opinions I greatly uh, respect that told us, don't do it. Like, do it for free. It's the only way to go. Right. And, and we had pretty good reasons why we didn't want to do it for free. And so we took a chance. And then we literally just sat here and was like, all right, let's see if anybody signs up. It could be a bomb, but we'll see. Yeah. So I, I'm just a big believer in you, you have to take those chances. And I know you've talked with Seth Godin before, and Seth's a you know, huge, huge proponent of that kind of thinking. Um, so I've always taken that approach, too, about if you're not afraid a little bit, if you don't have that little bit of anxiety of whether or not it's going to work, then you're probably not pushing yourself far enough. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that a healthy dose of fear is good. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I commend you guys on charging for that because, yeah, a lot of people would say, you know, give it, you know, put it behind the form, give it away for free. But if it has that value behind it, and it sounds like, you know, you've, you've sold a ton of, you know, programs. So, I mean, if it has that value, you know, don't be afraid to do that. And I commend you for that. So. Yeah. But cool. So, Paul, um, where can we find you guys online? Well, there's uh, PR2020.com is the agency site, and then MarketingAgencyInsider.com is the home of the book, and it's also the home of the community we're trying to build um, around the philosophies within the book, the more open and collaborative agency ecosystem. Um, so that's where we're doing all that. That's where the blog's at and the academy's at. Nice, nice. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on the show, and definitely everybody watching, check out the Marketing Agency Blueprint. It's a good read, and I highly recommend it. I appreciate it, Dave. You're welcome. All right.